What is worship? What's it not? Let's find out. Hey everybody, welcome to Behold and Sing. I'm so glad you're here with me today. I hope you all had a great 4th of July yesterday. We had a great time as our family. It was warm, a little bit overwhelming, but it was good. So I hope that uh, as you're back to work today, maybe some of you have a four-day weekend, whatever your case, I just pray that y'all are just doing really well today. I want to get into the word right away because I just have this feeling that this could go a little long. There's so much that's been stirring in me. I'm going to turn back to, well, let's start in John 15. Let's just, on the fly, let's just start a little different. John 15, you know that this is in within the discourse of Jesus on his final night with the disciples. And at this point, they have left the room where they were gathered together for the Last Supper, and they're walking toward the Garden of Gethsemane. And in chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus says this, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and ye also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I want you to remember that. The Spirit of of truth who does what testifies of jesus this is the main role the main purpose the main desire of the spirit of god is to testify of jesus he is the spirit of truth so let's remember that and now let's move back to john chapter 4 and a very well-known passage of scripture where jesus is talking to the lady that we call the woman at the well. All right, I I, I don't want to go into the whole background of her story. It's very interesting uh, indeed. But I want to just look at verse 23, verses 23 and 24. You all know this, but but I want to dig into it a little bit today. I want to see it from a different perspective. I want to see it in, in the context of what Jesus is saying, and I want to make sure that I'm doing what he says. I want to make sure that I'm understanding and walking in the light of Scripture. Okay, so verse 23, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So twice Jesus is saying that worshipers, the the kind of worshiper that God is seeking, that he's not just looking casually for, but he's desiring. In fact, he's, he's demanding this kind of worship. That word is very strong. They must worship the Father Very specific here, worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, we just learned that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. In this particular verse, 23, go back into the lexicon, look it up. This is not a capital S spirit. So it's not talking about worshiping in the Holy Spirit, but worshiping in spirit. In this particular context, he's talking about worshiping from that innermost place in you, that place that God gave you, that part of you that gives life to your flesh. That is when you're born again. And, and the Holy Ghost is in you. That spirit of truth is in you. He has brought life, the God kind of life, life to your spirit. You've been born again, okay? So you're alive in him. You're in him, and he's in you. So the spirit of truth 
is in your spirit and from your spirit, from that place that is indwelt and empowered and quickened by the spirit of God, who is the spirit of truth, we're to worship him from that place in spirit and in truth. He, he's almost saying the same thing twice because it's the spirit of truth who indwells us and empowers us. We worship from that place, that new born again place where all things are new. We worship in spirit and in truth. This word truth, it, it's talking about from that place of what is real, what is genuine, what is factual, not what is an illusion, but what is true. The things that the Holy Spirit has borne witness to in our own spirit. It's, it's not what I used to teach it, and I'm so sad that I taught it wrong. I had, I had parts of it right, but I thought that it meant that we would worship him in spirit, which was our emotional part, Okay, the, the part where people are moved to, to jump and dance and clap and, and weep and, and whatever, okay? And in truth, being doctrine. And so we needed to have a balance. We needed to have a balance in our worship that was doctrinal, and then we had to have a balance that allowed for emotional. <coughs> Wrong. In spirit. In that part of you that's been born again in your innermost being with your innermost, as it said in the Old Testament, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the worship he's talking about. That's the place of worship inhabited by who? The spirit of truth. There, there's no separation between e emotions and doctrine. And No, that's not what it's talking about. Worship from your innermost being and do it in, in genuine reality, not an illusion. Weeping, dancing, clapping, shouting, those things are not wrong, but they are wrong when we concentrate on them. And when we mistake them, those outward manifestations, those outward reactions to actual true worship. Because what I want to get to here today is what is this worship? Who is a worshiper? A, a worshiper is one who adores, according to the meaning of this word. One who adores the Father. That's a strong word. We, we sometimes throw love around in a very cast-off way. Oh, I, I love pizza. I, I love spaghetti. I, I love Hawaii. I love the beach. I love the mountains. Whatever. That, that's not love. And, and we sometimes say, oh, I adore a hot fudge sundae. No, you don't. To adore him is to worship him. They that are the true worshipers shall worship the Father. Do you know this word worship? means to bow the knee and to bend the forehead until it touches the earth. Humility. Coming down low, honoring him as God. Yes, our Father, but our Creator, our God, from whom our breath came, from whom the Spirit of God has been sent. To lead us into what? All truth. In him we live and move and have our being. Without him we're nothing. This adoration is a humble adoration. It's not about shouting for all the things that he's done for us and all the good things that he's done. No, there's nothing wrong with giving glory for the things that God has done, but this is not what he's talking about. He's talking about coming low, being humble, kneeling, lying prostrate at his feet. Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. If we could understand that the Holy 
spirit wants nothing more than to lead us into this truth that he is God and we are not. That Jesus was sent from the Father. First, we've got to grasp those central, simple truths. In John 17, Jesus over and over said to the Father, now they know that you have sent me. Now they know that you have sent me. This was important to him. That we know that Jesus has been sent by the Father. And then Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to testify of him. Our worship should be a joyful rejoicing in him, honoring the Father who began it all and who put forth every effort, every effort to reconcile us unto himself to deal with our sin problem. It's not his sin problem, it's ours. And he paid for it. Jesus paid for it with his own blood sent by the Father. And then because of that, because he resurrected to a new life, he was able to send the Holy Spirit to then walk with us, fill us, dwell in us, to bring us to a place where we can ultimately honor the Father Adore him for who he is. In our culture, in this modern day, we've made worship into a very, it's sickening to me sometimes. I, I love to worship God, but I can't stand when it's turned into a concert and people are more worried about the lights and the smoke. And, 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 and silly nonsense teachings that have risen up. Oh, we're going to shift the atmosphere. No, you're not. You're going to bow down and worship the Father. That's true worship. Oh, but Jehoshaphat, they, they praised and, and God shifted and, and dealt with their enemies. That's true. That is a proclamation of what happened. It's not a prescription for us to try to duplicate. Oh, the temple was filled with the glory of God because they were, they were praising in one accord and they couldn't even stand up. We're always trying to worship ourselves into an experience, into a shaking and a breaking of the chains like Paul and Silas. The Bible tells us about things that happened when people were truly worshiping but we're not to go after the experience do you understand the difference true worship is true adoration despite if there is ever a result in our flesh i, I want to look at what john saw in revelation i'm sorry if i'm ranting but i want so much for people to truly understand that our walk with Jesus is not about getting things, getting our way, having our best life now. No, it's about honoring him, worshiping him, praising him. Before I get to Revelation, I'm reminded of, of Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3. I want you to read them. On your own. Don't just, just believe me because I'm saying it. Both of those chapters are dealing with us, dealing with our flesh. Both of them are. Both of them are. Go read it. And at the end of each of those chapters, it says something very similar. In fact, let me just read the, the end. But you got to believe me. No, you don't. Go read it for yourself. Ephesians chapter 5, he's been talking about dealing with the flesh. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. And he goes on to talk about more sins. And the prescription is, don't be unwise, verse 17, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns 
and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not worshiping for the purpose of getting things, but worshiping, understanding that as we are filled with the Spirit, the Spirit of truth, as we're giving honor and glory to His name, that is a part of us actually dealing with our flesh. If you want to shift an atmosphere, shift the atmosphere within you. Stop sinning. Stop giving in to anger. Because we go to Colossians and we see something very similar. He wrote something very similar in chapter 3. He's talking about don't lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Going down to verse 16, let the word, what did Jesus say? Your word is truth. What did he say in John 6, 63? The words that I speak, they are spirit, they're life. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Another way of saying, be filled with the spirit. The word and the spirit are not separate. Okay, do you understand that? He's the spirit of truth. He's the spirit of the word. Okay, do you get it? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. I'm sorry, I'm so awkward with my microphone today. Teaching and admonishing one another in what? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and whatever you do in word or deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give me thanks to God and the Father by Him. If you want a result from your worship, this should be the result dealing with your flesh, dealing with your sin, walking uprightly and righteously and holy before Him. Revelation chapter 1. Just let myself calm down here a second as I turn the pages. This is John, who's turning to see the voice of the one that spake with him, verse 12, who is Jesus. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire and his feet like undefined brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shines in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. This was John who was the one closest to Jesus in his earthly walk, so much so that when Jesus hung on the cross in agony and pain and his mother and John were at the foot of the cross, he looked at John and he said, this woman is now your mother, take care of her, in other words. That's how close John and Jesus were. But when he saw him in his present glory, in heaven, He fell at his feet as one dead. That's the impact. That's the impact of knowing him. That's what should result. The worship, the bowing down humbly before him and adoring him simply for who he is. Not trying to work something up in a concert-like atmosphere not trying to say that we're shifting the atmosphere. We're doing war with our worship. I can't teach on all of those today, but I probably will because they're false doctrines. They're false. That's not what worship is. Not the worship that is in spirit and truth. Chapter 4. John says, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. After Jesus told him to take dictation and he wrote letters to seven churches, rebuking them. Do you understand? We've created 
Jesus into this best buddy friend that never says anything, anything negative to us. Wrong. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show you things which must be hereafter and immediately i was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne the father and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone and there was a a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald emerald and round about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats i saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment and They had on their heads crowns of gold, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. This is who we're worshiping. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf. The third had the face of a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, not in concert singing with 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 smoke and and light and a lot of emotion no saying holy 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 lord god almighty which was and is and is to come and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever the four and twenty elders fall down bow down heads to the floor worshiping adoring him and they worship him that lives forever and ever and they cast their thrones before the crest cast their crowns i'm sorry before the throne saying thou art worthy o lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created Chapter 5, verse 11, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times, 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. We have to get our narcissistic minds off of what worship can do for us or what worship is as a tool, or what worship is as a weapon. Stop. Worship him. Worship him who sits upon the throne. Worship him who stands before the throne in his white garment with his eyes of flame like fire and his feet as burnished brass. Worship the one who will ride upon the white steed in in a, a, a robe dipped in blood and his name is upon his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. Bow down, worship him, adore him. He is worthy to receive your glory and your honor. He is worthy for you to take the crown which represents power and authority, which represents uh, uh what do you call it? Reward. All the things that, that we think about and that we dream about, throw that thing down at his feet. It's nothing in his presence. I don't need a crown. I don't need a reward. I don't need power and authority. I need him. I need to worship him. I need to fall on my face at his feet. Not in a crowd with the perfect music and the perfect atmosphere and the perfect light show. I need to fall at his feet here in my living room, at my bedside, wherever I am when I consider him. 
Him who is perfect, who sent His Son, who gave Him to die for me, who doesn't deserve anything, who at age 62 is relearning His written glorious scripture because I messed it up for so long. I deserve nothing. Must worship Him. Must worship Him in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks after such to worship Him. The Spirit of truth is crying out. He's not the one that's causing us to act crazy on the earth. He's not causing the church to break apart and fall down. He's not causing us to misunderstand. He's the spirit of the truth crying out, trying to get our attention back on this word. Trying to get us to understand who it is that we're worshiping and how we should worship. In spirit, in truth. Not in emotion, not in craziness. Not thinking we're some heavenly praising warrior. Stop. Just stop. Stop and read the scripture and stop trying to put yourself in every story. There was one Jericho march. That's it. There was one Jehoshaphat battle. That's it. Oh, but we're to, we're to lie upon our bed and, and, and have the high praises of God in our mouth and a two-edged sword in our hand. Yep. That's what David did. He was a good worshiper in the sheepfold. He was also a good literal warrior with a literal sword. It's not telling us that praise is a sword. Worship is adoration for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, forgive us. Forgive us for misunderstanding. Forgive us, God, for taking worship which belongs to you, and making it something that brings benefit to ourselves. Forgive us, God, for believing every wind of doctrine that someone told us that worship was. Point us back to your truth, Holy Spirit of God, Spirit of truth. Take us back into this word and show us what it is. To truly worship the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Help us, oh God. Help us to walk forward. Help us, Lord, to repent, turn around, and go the right way, the narrow way. God bless you, my friend. I will see you soon.